Hello, and welcome to another video lecture for Mr. Moser's 8th grade U.S. History class. Uh, the purpose of today's lecture is to look at labor unions, changing a big business. The textbook readings that goes with this particular lecture comes to us from pages 624 to 627. Uh, the title of that section is The Industrial Workers. The guiding questions today are, what is a labor or trade union? And then what are the two areas that, we, that they try to help their workers? Um, describe the two tactics that labor unions typically use, such as going on strike and something called collective bargaining. And how did factory owners resist labor unions? And what happened at the Haymarket Square in 1886? Uh, uh, so those are going to be kind of our guiding questions here for today. So let's do some definitions here. What is a trade or a labor union? A trade or a labor union is an organization that brings workers together that work in the same basic trade or job. That's why sometimes they're known as trade unions because they're unifying, because they're unifying a particular group of workers of a particular trade, like carpenters or iron workers or plumbers or teachers. Um, they're kind of all the same group of type of workers and they kind of work together to fight for two basic things. Typically, trade or labor unions work for better wages for their workers and better working conditions. And those are the two big areas that the unions tie to help with with their workers. The idea with unions is to kind of unify the workers together so there's kind of a common message and it's kind of solidarity together as a group so that they can kind of go up against their, their employers. Uh, their, their factory owners, people are employing them, I should say their employees, um, not their employers, but their employees. And that's, and that's a big aspect of these labor unions. And there are lots of examples of labor unions. Uh, for example, I belong to a teacher's union uh, that helps look after my needs and other teachers in the district that we work in here. Uh, there's firefighter unions that help with the firefighters of our community. There's police unions that work with the police of our, of our, of our community. Uh, there's also uh, auto workers that were unionized. There are uh, steel workers who unionize, electricians who unionize. There's lots of different kind of groups of people that kind of band together to form this group of solidarity so they can kind of work together to fight for their better wages for them as employers, uh, employees uh, from their employers, and also better working conditions. How do unions do those things? Well, they use generally two strike tactics to kind of help fight for change. And one of those is called going on strike. To strike basically means that you're going to stop working. Uh, so as a group of workers in a factory or in an industry, you're just going to decide as a group, we're going to shut the production down in the factory by just not working. And we're going to protest out in front of the factory uh, to demand what we want, whether it's higher salary or a safer working conditions or more benefits, we're going to prevent that company from making a profit uh, because as workers, we're not going to work. And that only works if all the members in a union agree on to go on strike. And strikes were pretty common uh, during the 1800s and early 1900s during the industrial age uh, where workers were trying to band together to form these unions to prevent uh, this particular incident. We'll talk later on about one particular strike called the Homestead Strike, which will be a very violent, violent strike uh, that will not end very well. Another practice that unions use is called collective bargaining. Uh, collective bargaining is as a union, they set up a negotiator, kind of a representative of the workers who meet with management of the business or the factory. And they sit down at a table and they discuss things such as better pay, working conditions, on behalf of all of the union workers. The strategy for collective bargaining is, is that by having one voice of one representative, instead of having every individual worker go meet with the, the management, it's just not as feasible. So by banding together and electing a representative from that union to go and talk to management, hopefully you can say, well, here is what the workers want, uh, what can you give us, and they kind of negotiate out kind of a deal and a contract. As a teacher who belongs to a union, um, that's one of the things that my union does for me, is that I don't negotiate my contract with the school district. Um, my union representatives do. They sit down with school officials, and they look at concerns that we have as workers, and they try to iron out kind of a, a contract, and then we as members vote on the final settlement, and we either say, yes, we like this agreement, or no, go back and, and try again. 
And that's another practice that unions use is this practice of collective bargaining. The idea is collective, kind of as a group, bringing them all together, all the workers together, to get one representative to bargain to management, to the owners of the factory, to say, here are our demands. Here's what we would like to see happen to improve the working conditions and pay of our particular workers. Now, in the industrial era, factories and businesses did not like unions because it meant them having to put more money into paying higher wages and to improve their factories, which means that that's less profits that they make in their production. So there's a lot of resistance, especially in the er early 1900s and late 1800s, um, towards this unionization efforts. And in fact, many of the different strikes that union workers will go on will turn very violent and very deadly. As you can see in the primary source photograph over there, uh, you see outside of this factory, uh, the union uh, is out here protesting over here in the streets, and then the owners of the factory brought in armed guards uh, with rifles that are kind of out protecting the gates of the workers to bring in strike breakers, basically non-union workers to come in to keep the production of the factory going to kind of try to break the strike, and sometimes these will turn very, very deadly. Uh, violence will break out. And we'll talk about some of these examples uh, here in the next few days. Uh, factory owners oftentimes made their workers sign pledges, basically saying, if you so sign up with a union, you can't work for me. And so there was sometimes kind of a, an effort by owners of factories to basically tell the, tell the workers, hey, if you belong to a union, you won't be hired. I'll fire you right on the spot. And, and that happened for a lot of union members, too. Uh, there's a lot of conflict early on in American history in the, in, the, in the late 1800s and early 1900s between these factory owners and businesses who were kind of used to this laissez-faire, you know, we can do what we want, uh, we can pay our workers what we want, we don't need to listen to anybody, we're in it to make profit, this is kind of survival of the fittest, this kind of social Darwinism in a sense that, you know, we're fighting for our survival as, as business leaders and, you know, we can't pay our workers more because it's going to hurt our bottom line. It's going to hurt us making profits. And so there's a lot of resistance to unions. And, and by the time we get into the 20s and 30s, uh, the, the government will step in and, and kind of put some safeguards in place for unions to make sure that they can operate uh, for, the, for the benefits of their workers. Um, but it's, it's a challenge and it's a struggle that will take place really throughout the rest of the industrial era and revolution, really up into the Great Depression. Uh, in the 1930s, which we'll kind of get to when we get to the, that particular era and time period. Like I mentioned before, sometimes union efforts turn very, very violent, and one such was the Haymarket Square incident. Uh, this was a strike rally that took place in Chicago, about 200,000 workers who belonged to a kind of a, a interesting labor union called the Knights of Labor that was kind of a hodgepodge of different workers in different sectors and different industries. It wasn't necessarily one specific you know, trade union. It was kind of a grouping of people from all different societies, uh, groups, working groups, classes uh, of, uh, of whites and minorities. And they were holding this big, massive rally here at a place in Chicago called Haymarket. And as they were protesting, and you, they can see here in the photograph here, you've got an orator, a speaker here, you know, giving a very passionate speech about the demands of the workers being met. And sometime during this, this rally, someone throws a bomb, uh, a grenade, at a bunch of police officers that have kind of shown up to kind of maintain law and order, and the bomb goes off. And the police feel, oh my gosh, we're under attack, and they start shooting at the protesters and the ralliers, and the ralliers shoot back, and it's just this melee of violence. Uh, several people are wounded, some are, some are killed, uh, and it really kind of uh, tainted, in a sense, this, this rally. Uh, and, and, and fearing violence, uh, a lot of business owners just didn't want anything to do with any members of the Knights of Labor. So after this particular incident, uh, they basically, you know, if you're a member of the Knights of Labor, we don't want you. And, and, and the union kind of falls apart uh, as a result of this particular incident here. And, and that was pretty common during that time period as you have these very violent incidences, you will see uh, membership in unions initially raise and grow and get larger and larger, uh, but things like the Haymarket Riot, uh, we'll see those numbers begin to kind of drop a little bit uh, from fear that, that violence. But so it's a very tense situation between the workers and the factory owners uh, throughout the early uh, 1900s and late 1800s as workers are you know, fighting for things like better conditions, better salary, better pay, and business owners just want to you know bottom line, they're in to make business, because if you don't make money in a business, you go 
out of business. And so it's this constant conflict that's occurring in the 1800s and early 1900s from this particular time period. So if we think a little bit about the idea of the unions and, and workers' efforts, we think about, you know, the labor unions, their goal is to really try to make sure that they bring better working conditions to their workers, they give them more salary so they don't have to work so hard and have all members of their family work. They use practices like going on strike where all the workers agree, we're not going to work today, we're going to protest out in front until our demands are met. Or using the practices of collective bargaining, which is the negotiating one representative of the union to go meet with management and saying, here's what we want to have happen um, to, to kind of bring about those better conditions and working conditions. So throughout the 1800s and early 1900s, with the rise of business uh, and this progressive movement of bringing about changes and fixing some of these problems in society, labor unions are going to play a very pivotal role throughout those different changes. So thank you for listening. As always, if you have questions, please come see your teacher, but have a good day.